So imagine you have a goal in mind. You want to get to work. I used to ask my students a question like this. is like, well, maybe they're going to write an essay. Why are you writing the essay? Why are you in class? Well, I'm in class because I, uh, I, need, to, I need this class because I, it's part of my major. Well, why, why, did you, why did you pick a major like that? Well, I'm interested in psychology. Well, why did you come to get a degree? Well, um, I think I need a degree to get a job. Well, why do you need a job? Well, I need a job to keep body and soul together and maybe to be productive and maybe to you know, establish a name for myself. And why do you want to do that? Well, because you know, it's, it's part and parcel of living properly. And why do you want to live properly? And, well then, and how would you live if you lived properly? And at that point, people are usually unable to answer. You know, because you can just push people with questions about why until they run out of explanations. But the point is, is that you're always doing whatever you're doing because what you're doing is nested in a sequence of goal-directed actions. And those can be more or less sophisticated. If you're not very sophisticated at all, you, the nesting might be like two structures deep. You know, maybe you're, uh, I don't know, you're bored and you want to go get drunk, you know, and why? Well, because you don't want to be bored. And, and, and if someone pushes you a little farther than that, you just, you hit them. And, you know, you don't, you don't want to delve into it. But if you're sophisticated, you have a pretty good hi hierarchy of, 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 of answers. So you might say, well, why, why do you want to be a productive and generous citizen? And, and, and like I said, people usually bought them out there. But you could say, well, that's part of reciprocal altruism. And if I'm productive and generous, then that'll encourage other people to be productive and generous. And if we're all productive and generous together, then there'll be more for everyone and we'll all get along better and we'll get along for a longer period of time and that'll make us all more stable and that'll make our societies better. And then you might say, well, why is that relevant? You might say, well, because the alternative to that is something like a descent into something approximating hell and so that's part of a reflection of the divine order and the eternal battle between good and evil and then you could push it farther than that and you could say, well, are you going to be on the side of the redemptive hero or are you going to be si on the side of the eternal adversary? Like you can keep digging down farther and farther and the farther down you dig, you, the more you get down into what you might describe as the implicit religious substrate. And, uh, and it's very much useful to know that and to make as much of that conscious as possible. So now imagine that you've... Uh, You've come to this talk tonight because you've decided to aim up. And maybe you haven't formulated that precisely explicitly, but something is driving you in this direction. And then you come to the talk and you find out that I'm talking about something that isn't what you expected and it doesn't seem to be moving you along on your pathway forward to that end. What's going to happen is you're going to be disappointed. And you might be anxious too. You're going to be disappointed because disappointment signals that you're experiencing something that's not relevant to the goal that you are attempting to pursue and that might in fact be interfering with it. That's what negative emotion does. And maybe if you're disappointed in what I say, that also makes you anxious because you assume that you would come here and I would say something relevant because you assumed that you knew who I was and then it turned out that I didn't and then you don't know who I am and then you don't know what you're doing here and then you get anxious and the reason you get anxious is because that's what anxiety is for. It tells you when the pathway to your goal has been disrupted, so multiple pathways have now emerged. So imagine you're driving your car to work and it quits. And what happens is you get anxious. And the reason you get anxious is because, well, you were beetling along quite nicely in your world and everything was reduced to like a unidimensional simplicity. You weren't in a car as an object, you were in a thing that took you to where you wanted to go, and it was just doing what it was supposed to be doing, tracking you along the pathway to your goal. And then it fails, and you're off on the side of the road, and you get anxious because how the hell are you going to get to work, and what if you don't get to work, and is your boss not going to be very happy with you, and maybe this is the third mistake you've made this week, and what if you get fired, and weren't you an idiot for buying this car, maybe you shouldn't have a car at all, maybe you should have walked to work, and 
you know, maybe you should take a bicycle because after all, that would save the planet. And, you know, and maybe now you have to take your car to a mechanic. But the last time you went to the mechanic, you got ripped off because you're too stupid about vehicles to manage one. And you're kind of stupid about technology in general. And aren't you stupid? And maybe you're too stupid. And isn't your wife going to... That's anxiety. Right? And that's the emergence of a multiplicity of pathways. Right? And so what anxiety signifies is the degeneration of a, an attentional hierarchy into multiplicity. And the reason you get anxious and it feels bad is because now your body can't compute how much energy you have to put out in order to get to your goal. And so you, you can't organize the world. You're, you're, you're apt to use more resources than you'll replenish. And if you continue to do that, then you'll die. And so anxiety is a signal that complexity has re-emerged. Chaos, that's the eternal dragon of chaos. Chaos has re-emerged because your narrative has collapsed. And so, so that's negative emotion. That's what negative emotion signifies, is that it's the, it's the collapse of an organizing narrative. So that's very interesting to know. So you feel positive. If I walk on the stage and I see, I know I'm supposed to go to the front of the stage, say, and the reason I want to do that is because I know I have to talk to you, and that's nest, and I want to talk to you because I think it's valuable to talk to you, etc. That's nested in a hierarchy of value. And if I see a clear pathway to the front of the stage, then that actually produces positive emotion. And that positive emotion impels tells me forward because positive emotion does impel you forward. That's what it's for. That's how positive emotion is linked to action. So if you're enthusiastic, you're enthusiastic because you can see a pathway forward to a valued goal, and that enthusiasm manifests itself. This is true even neurochemically. It manifests itself as positive motivation to move forward. And not only that, if you're moving forward and it's working, your brain tracks the fact that it's working. And then th that's linked to dopamine release, by the way, which is what cocaine releases. Um, it's re linked to dopamine release. And the other thing your brain is doing, even when you're just walking to where you want to go, if you're successfully walking there, your brain tracks what you're doing. There's circuits that are activated while you're doing it. And if what you're doing results in the result you desired, then the dopamine floods those little neurons that are active and it makes them grow and, and flourish. And so as you practice something that's working, the circuit that is activated as you're practicing is bathed in dopamine and that, that makes it stronger. And that feels good. It's growth. It's part of positive emotion. And so the positive emotion moves you forward, but also encourages you to develop a habit of that practice. And so one of the things I would bloody well say is don't make a habit of pursuing things that aren't good for you because you build that into you. That's what happens if you become addicted to something, you know. You build a little monster inside you that's grown. It's there. It's, it's after one goal uh, despite everything else. Not a good outcome. So now positive emotion also signals the fact that it's also an energy conservation observation. So as I move forward towards my goal, with each step I take, it's going to take less energy to get to the goal. And so that means I'm, that, that the positive motion signifies, what would you say? It signifies the increasing efficiency of your action as you move towards a goal. So negative emotion signifies the fact that things have got too complex for you to, to manage, and positive emotion signifies that you're approaching your goal and becoming, and that there's less demand on energy output with every step forward. And so that's emotion, and that's pretty much worth knowing. And then what happens when you're watching a movie is you, you, you infer the goal of the protagonist, or, or, the, or the villain for that matter, you infer the goal of the character that's being portrayed on the screen, you adopt that goal as your own, then you play out the emotions in your own body, which mimics the structure that's, that, what would you call, the character that's being portrayed on the screen, and you live that all out inside you. And that's also how you understand other people. Right? You don't listen to someone and then figure out what they're saying and then infer what they're thinking. That isn't how it works. What you do is you listen to someone until you've 
figure out what they're up to. As soon as you figure out what they're up to, you can adopt that frame of reference. As soon as you adopt that frame of reference, you have the same emotions. And that's what makes you united. And so that's so interesting. And so then you think, look, there's 5,000 people in here. If there were 5,000 chimpanzees, you guys would be tearing each other into shreds because no one would be able to know what anyone else was up to. But because all of you are here paying attention to the same thing in the same way, you have virtually identical emotional states, and that means instantly your behavior is rendered predictable to one another. And there's no difference between that and peace. They're the same thing. And so what that means is that one of the predicates of a civil, productive, and peaceful society is that everyone inhabits the same narrative. And you might say, well, we don't need the same narrative. It's like, yes, we do, because if we inhabit a different narrative, then we're running emotionally in different directions, and we will not understand each other, and we will run into conflict, and that conflict can become deadly at, at the drop of a hat. And so it's, it's a precondition for a civil society that everyone is united in the same narrative. And then that begs the question, right? What is the narrative insofar as we're unified? And another question, which is, what should the narrative be? Right? Now, the postmodernists figured out that we looked at the world through a story, but they said they became, their mantra is, they became skeptical of meta-narratives, which are uniting narratives. And that's all well and good to be skeptical about meta-narratives, but you run into the problem of internal disunion, because if you don't have a uniting narrative, then you're divided against yourself.